Crip Camp, the documentary. It's the untold story about disabled teens and the legacy of the community that thrived out of the revolutionary Camp Gen Ed. Crip Camp, Crip Camp had its premiere at Sundance 2020 on opening night. It was subsequently awarded the Audience Award and Crip Camp is available in 190 countries on Netflix. Let's watch a clip of Crip Camp. Wait, you want me to tell me what happened? <laughs> well, two people got cramps and they're spreading. We were all very hyper about it. And I have to go shower some people. <laughs> See you later. I wanted to be part of the world, but I didn't see anyone like me in it. I hear about a summer camp for the handicapped run by hippies. Somebody said he probably will smoke dope with the counselors, and I'm like, sign me up. Come to Camp Jeanette and find yourself. There I was. I was in Woodstock. You wouldn't be picked to be on a team back home, but at Jeanette, you had to go up the back. Even when we were that young, we helped empower each other. It was allowing us to recognize that the status quo is not what it needed to be. The world always wants us dead. We live with that reality. At the time, so many kids just like me were being sent to institutions. It was just a continual struggle. Most disabled people, like myself, are unable to use public transportation. We needed a civil rights law of our own. A rehabilitation program has been vetoed by the president because it was cost prohibitive. We decided we were going to have a demonstration. You get the call to action to the barricades. A small army of the handicapped have occupied this building for the past 11 days. So many people from Camp Jeanette found their way into the building. The FBI cut off the phones. The deaf people went, we know what to do. That's how we communicated to the people outside the building. The Black Panther Party would bring a hot meal. We were like this. We are the strongest political force in this country. We will no longer allow the government to oppress disabled individuals. And I would appreciate it if you would stop shaking your head in agreement when I don't think you understand what we are talking about. What we saw at that camp was that our lives could be better. If you don't demand what you believe in for yourself, you're not going to get it. I said you like to see um, the handicapped people depicted as people. Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> Nicole and Jim, what was your original vision for Crip Camp's impact? What did you want the film to do for the ongoing disability movement? And anything else related to that that you'd like to share? I think that our primary goal for the film was to help reframe what it means to be disabled. And not just for people without disabilities, but also for people with disabilities. That um, if one could get more people to identify uh, as disabled, that it's a positive move, you know, purely from a political standpoint, there's many more voters who are identifying and, and such. And, but it's also, you know, important to try to eliminate the stigma of disability. Yeah, I mean, when we, um, we always wanted the film to have a robust impact campaign and we wanted to work with the disability community and the disability activists of today. And we knew that we had to make a bridge because the film is set in the 70s and, um, and it's um, set in the disability rights movement of the 70s. And it's such a powerful, powerful story, um, but it's out of the past. Um, and so we actually convened a big uh, brain trust um, the fall before we finished the film um, with a really amazing um, group of uh, activists and people from different, um, working in different aspects of entertainment, et cetera, with disabilities and, and sort of asked like, what, what is the most important thing the film could do? And we were honestly sort of thinking that um, we might focus around particular policy points, you know, um, or agreements or things like that. And what we heard back from people 
um, was that actually the maybe the biggest need was to um, to provide kind of places and spaces for people to gather um, to also to um, to encourage people to identify um, people who who might really benefit from um, joining can you hear me sorry okay um, you know from from joining the movement or joining the community but might not actually see a positive in and identifying um, and to kind of um, look at how we could create spaces like Camp Gen Ed um, spaces that were kind of liberatory spaces for people to come together and so um, so that is something we we um, we kind of we're trying to figure our, our way towards for the impact campaign. I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't ask about, you know, what it takes to create an impact campaign that does what you're interested in having it do and what that costs. So I don't know if you're willing to share what your vision was for, um, for Crip Camp's impact campaign and, 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 how much you thought that that would cost because I think there are a lot of filmmakers who think about impact and don't necessarily know what that really means in terms of uh, funding. Well, we had, um, you know, we had big dreams for the impact campaign that got um, really shaped and focused once Andrea and Stacy Park, um, who designed it, came on board. Um, but we always knew that we, that, I mean, I've known, I've, I've, I've had uh, impact campaigns with my previous documentaries and, and I've always found that like if you wait to start fundraising for the impact campaign or you wait to start figuring it out until the film's about to come out, it's sort of too late. You really want to capitalize on that moment when the film is entering the world and they're really big, complicated, um, you know, difficult things to get off the ground. Um, and so we actually, um, we raised... Um, you know, um, about $800,000 um, for, for this campaign. And it was um, largely the work of Sarah Boulder, um, our, our producer, um, who did that. And, um, and we really, we put a, a huge amount of effort into that kind of all the way along, actually, as we were um, working on the film, we were thinking about this and strategizing about it. Jim, did you want to add to that? Um, the, no, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, we did talk to other filmmakers about their campaigns and um, really gathered a lot of information, but Nicole is absolutely right. You know, it, it's all, also, if you're trying to raise the last little bit of money to finish your film, but you also need a fundraise for your impact campaign, it can become a little, uh, you know, I don't know, nerve wracking, but uh, fortunately, we've had just a great amount of support from many organizations and people. Um, can you talk, both of you, a little bit about how Stacy Park Milburn and Andrea Levant became involved with your impact campaign and, and, and what did they bring? How did they elevate the campaign? It's like the greatest story of our project, actually. I mean, uh, we've been working with this amazing firm, Uncommon, uh, to, to kind of, um, you know, host the brain trust and start thinking about the campaign. And initially, we had sort of a structure where we were like, okay, we're going to have, um, you know, a, an impact, like a sort of seasoned impact producer, campaign director, probably, and then we're going to have you know, folks from the community as consultants, um, organizers. And then we sort of like had this kind of come to Jesus moment with ourselves where we realized like we're actually not going to be able to do what we want to do unless we really give this whole campaign over to the community. And we were recognizing that a lot of the most um, exciting, um, really groundbreaking work, the work that kind of carries forward the spirit of Crip Camp, um, in this moment was being done actually a lot of it in our own backyard in the Bay Area by the disability justice movement. Um, and so uh, we, um, we put out a call for, for people and we um, to, to run the campaign and, um, and Stacy and Andrea proposed to, to do it together. Um, and are just such an incredible combination of you know, having really deep experience in grassroots organizing and advocacy, but also 
um, you know, having communications experience and a, and a real passion for an interest in culture shift and culture change in media. So, um, and, and then, I mean, even in the first phone call with them, they were just like visioning out these, you know, dreams for what the campaign could do that were like so much um, further and bigger than what we had imagined. And um, yeah, and Jim, I'd love it if you could add to that. No, it's just, you know, we kind of start down this one track, like you say, and then opening it up and then talking to Stacey and Andrea was like, wow, it's like, we're going to go on a spaceship with these people. It's, you know, we're going to go, you know, it's like the USS Enterprise. We're going to go out into the universe because there were just ideas that were beyond our imagination in regards to like what we're doing now, like with our, 16 uh, Sunday uh, workshops that, that we're holding in this virtual crib camp. We might talk about that a little bit later, but it was just that energy, but also it really taps in to the current movement and the current leaders and the, and the people that are really pushing together the, the current agenda of disability rights and justice. So Andrea, please talk about the latitude that you had in just taking the campaign and running with it and, and what your experiences, um, how those experiences helped to inform what you came up with for Crip Camp. So, well, thank you all. And um, I just, this is a, a beautiful moment. And I would say in terms of the, well, I say the biggest thing that, that that we brought to the campaign is the lived experience as um, disabled folks, but not only as disabled folks, um, both Stacy and I um, representing multiple identities. So me as a black disabled woman, her as a queer um, uh, biracial uh, woman, both with disabilities, physical disabilities. And so that um, obviously first and foremost is what tied us and committed us so much to the film. And then obviously we have, we both had, um, you know, professional experience that, that lended itself well to the campaign. I think that when I think about the latitude, that is really why uh, we were able to take it where, where we could, because immediately we felt like there was this opportunity to dream big and there was we felt trusted, which I think is actually a unique experience for disabled people, unfortunately. Um, I feel like we often enter spaces feeling like we're required to prove ourselves first um, before we are given, um, you know, kind of a hold or, or allowed to really lead um, unless they're fully disabled spaces or, full, you know, um, and we immediately came in like, okay, wow, we have in essence been given, and I was just talking to um, one of our team members last night, and it's like we have been given the opportunity to create our dream world, um, to create the, uh, basically everything that we always would have wanted. Um, and feeling that support and trust, I think is what helped us to uh, really feel like we could create and innovate. Um, and then I think also, we entered at a time, you know, where a lot of people were nervous because it was, we started kind of the week before the shutdowns um, around COVID happened. And so there was this, um, there was this, you know, what are we going to do based on what traditional impact campaigns kind of look like? And we had not been impact producers before, so we didn't have anything to compare it to, to be like, oh, this is what normally happens and what are we gonna do and how are we gonna shift? We knew that as, again, disabled folks that are quite used to adapting and adjusting to um, the world that isn't created for us or wasn't, you know, like the world meaning what access looks like, um, we're used to navigating in virtual spaces. We're used to coming up with, you know, new ideas and all of this. And so for us, it wasn't even a challenge. It was an opportunity. You know, we were like, okay, cool. Oh, we can awesome. make this work. So I want to get Storm in here in a moment, but 
Andrea, if you would just speak uh, briefly about um, one of the ideas that that um, you and Stacy came up with that seems to have just skyrocketed, which is the Crip Camp 2020. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So we had this idea knowing that we were in a virtual world and also um, I think from an access perspective to, you know, it was literally, what if we did a virtual camp? Um, and and because of, um, of course at first thinking, oh, we, we could do in-person things, but a virtual camp experience that um, would would be would provide an opportunity to bring in some treasured voices but also people that you know we a lot of people don't know um to train and to just learn and to grow together as grassroots advocates and activists um and so when i remember us going you know could we do maybe we'll do a few weeks and if we can get a thousand people that would be, you know, amazing. And, um, and so we just started putting together what's essentially a syllabus um, that really goes, it covers everything. And I think what I heard, and, and I love hearing from, the, from our community that says, these are the topics that nobody ever talks about. So everything from, you know, Black disabled a activism to, you know, uh, we had a session on shedding shame and trauma-informed care, intersectionality, let's talk about sex, you know, spirituality and disability. So all of these things that we don't hit a lot. Um, and so we host these every Sunday and our dream of 1000 has now uh, translated into almost 8,000 people that um, have signed up for this amazing experience. So. Wow, wow, wow. Well, Storm, um, please describe your, um, your your role as a, an advisor to the impact campaign and talk a little bit about um how your experience and participation in the ongoing disability revolution um has sort of informed the things that you've raised or stressed for the campaign thank you my involvement with this disability community, I've, it's been ongoing. So when I got um, recruited as an advisor, um, it was a real honor because it provides the space for disability plus the IPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color, plus intersectionality. And it gives the resources and the access to create just like they, created the power statement, the powerful movement, the film, the Crip Camp. So that being said, I'm able to bring from my experience, my professional experience, my expertise involved in advertising in the industry there, considering the first deaf woman involved, yes, but I wanna be able to bring that because the door was open for me. So I wanna be, I don't want it just to be me. I, wanted, I don't want to be alone in this specific industry, but I want to be able to give to those who will join the new and apply, maybe 10 to 12, involved in this fellowship program and just hand it. I want to be able to give back and support um, not only just the learning, but also really owning the narrative of who they are and their rights. Because honestly, if you think about it, you go out the door and it's, it's not really safe for all of us. On top of that, what's going on currently with COVID, and then we have Black Lives Matter. So we really also have Black Disability Group are there as well. So if we overlook the disability, you know, by the color of our skin as well. So it just, it's very traumatic. And it's a process that we have to deal with. You know, it, an oppressive weight on our, that we carry every day. So it goes back to feeling maybe I'm not sure where to start or do I want to create on this platform or do I want to do this artwork or do I want to create, you know, be involved in politics? I'm not sure, you know, so the emotional mental health is already impacted what's going on right now. So we're going through that. I'm sure many others are going through it. At the same time, we have to continue to remind ourselves 
the epitome of power that we already have within us as a person with a disability to deliver this space uh, impact, to impact the campaign with the amazing resources that we could partner with Adobe and that they could provide you know, creative um, things for the year and mentorship and support and advice. So honestly, it's, it's the more I think about it, this platform, this really actually draws me to amazing people like Jim, Judy, Claudia, Gordon, who's a black deaf woman, a lawyer, she's the first lawyer, Natasha Colfley, who she's an actress and a writer and an advocate. And then, you know, so we're not alone. So we're not alone in this, we're in this together. So, so I'm really excited to be a part of this advisory to give back and maintain and save the power that they, that they already have. Thank you so much, Storm. And you know, Storm brought up something that, that I wanted to ask all of you, um, which has to do with this Black Lives Matter moment, right? Um, she talked about how, um, you know, as both a black person and a disabled person, when she walks out the door, she's not necessarily safe, right? And so I'm interested in hearing from you, how do we, um, as, a, as a global community really, lift up um, and, and acknowledge um, disabilities of all kinds, in the moment that we're dealing with when black lives are being stressed in particular how do we make sure that that conversation about um what is going on in the disabled community and what still needs to happen is not forgotten in that conversation any sure i can can speak to that um we're coming off of this uh amazing session that we had on Sunday on Black Disabled Activism. And I think that, you know, again, to Storm's point, um, you know, a lot of times we silo things into specific one, like one identity. And the fact is that, you know, so many of us carry multiple and that intersectionality. And I think about um, Anita Cameron, who is an amazing activist. She's an elder in our community. And she said, you know, you can be invited to the table and still be on the menu. And it was so powerful because so many times there's, there's this tokenism and we need to get beyond that. Don't just, you know, oh, look at a group and say, oh, we need one person and who do you know? But it's actually about relationship building. And one, uh, another thing she says is, you know, it's great for organizations and we see so many organizations doing this where they're issuing these statements, but what are we going to do in real life? And so, you know, and she said, what actual concrete, tangible, measurable things are we going to do to dismantle? In this case, she's talking about, you know, structural racism, but it's the same in terms of ableism, you know, within our organizations. And so what it's actually sitting down with people that know, it's actually bringing them to the table, but, at, but not just having them there, actually actively engaging and, and, and being quiet and listening and then activating based on um, those things and recognizing that all of our experiences, just because we carry, you know, disability or black or whatever are not the same. Um, there's not a cookie cutter way to do this. And that's why the more people you have um, that are, are helping inform your decision making, um, the better. I just want to insert a comment from one of the attendees, which is, you know, uh, really interesting. Um, Susan Richards says, when I go to the hospital, I don't feel safe that no one will sterilize me without consent. Seriously, it still happens to that point. Anyone want to speak to how that works within this framework of Black Lives Matter, um, but also uh, the disabled uh, or the disability movement? I mean, it's shocking that that's true. 
and that that fear really exists and it and it really comes down to how people with disabilities are regarded in society and um it you know i i have to say that part of the discussions right now um in society right now is uh, policing and dismantling police or retraining or whatever you want to call it many people with disabilities cannot comply not because they don't want to but because let's say if you have a hearing impairment you don't understand what's going on there's many many instances of deaf and hard of hearing uh citizens being killed by the police simply because they were trying to like run home to get somebody that can interpret for them or trying to reach into their pocket for a card or something that says I'm deaf and um, or people who are autistic. So what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to not be out in the world? You know, should we have jackets on that say, help me or don't kill me. I'm disabled. I mean, and this kind of training has to be part of whatever we're developing. Um, I also wanted to say that one of the things that I've been so impressed with um, Andre and Stacy and the way that they're working and leveraging the campaign is that um, making partnerships with organizations that are focused on racial justice work, whether it be in education or whether it be, um, you know, like color of change and trying to forge partnerships um, around the Im impact campaign in meaningful ways so that the issues that are intersecting between racial justice and disability um, like the ones that were discussed at the virtual Crip Camp on Sunday are ones that are really coming up to the fore. And that's been really powerful. So an example is when, um, when the pandemic happened, there was a, a recognition that, um, that there really was um, an emergency need to raise money and to have a fund for, um, for uh, disabled creatives and activists of color um, just to get through the pandemic. And, um, and so uh, we did. We we raised money and created a fund, and um, and Andrea and Stacy's vision was to have that housed at Color of Change. Um, who, um, Andrea, you can speak to this better than me, but we're really receptive um, and, and and engaged, and and so I think that I'm, I've always seen in impact campaigns uh, that there that that you have this extraordinary opportunity to kind of create partnerships. But I think that the way that Andrea and Stacy have um, have forged them is is so kind of long-term thinking and so strategic, not just for getting Crip Camp out in the world and leveraging that story, but also for just like lifting up the whole movement and, and bringing it forward. And especially for, um, for, for this really critical particular intersectional issue. Yeah, Storm wanted to say something about this issue. Yes, Storm. Yes, yes, I do. Um, so during the light of today's, the, the climate of what's going on and also the crucial allyship. Allyship is, has multiple dimensional layers and levels. And what does it really look like? And what do we imagine it should look like? Oftentimes people say, oh, it's a one big decision that makes me an ally or one big action. No, it does not. Ally really is defined by an action that you have to roll up your sleeves and really work and get the education and be included. You know, the BIPOC and the black disability, including during this time of, of this movement, because life, this Life Matters movement, there's times that we're already, I remember Andrea um, mentioned yesterday or the other day, 50%, I'm not sure exactly, so please correct me if I'm wrong, um, but 50% of black disability get killed like what? That number? That's high. That's huge. It's kind of unfortunate if anything, surprise, if a surprising number goes up during this time. So ally really is just crucial to have that performing the allyship goal at the heart and mind commitment to dismantle the system of oppression, not just the barrier, but the oppression system of all forms. You know, we we can't do we can't do this alone. Yeah, you could partner, you know, in organizations and help finances, but ally too. You know, they already have the power to move forward for the greater change with us. You know, we 
is that we deserve to give, have our given right to be safe, be seen, be heard, and be felt. So. Absolutely. And actually, it's, it, um, I know exactly what you're talking about, Storm. It, I believe the, the statistic is that 50% of um, Black people who are killed by police are disabled, uh, which is just stunning. Um, so, oh, okay, I, thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm, no problem. Uh, so I, I wanted to, I mean, we could talk about <laughs> this moment and all the ways that the disability movement intersects with Black Lives Matter. Um, I wanted to talk more about Crip Camp and the, the ways that it has been able to change attitudes um, and the extent to which it has. So um, Jim and Nicole, what has made you most proud about what Crip Camp has achieved? I, I have to say that we've seen a lot of, uh, first off, so many discussions are happening because of the, of the film. I mean, even this discussion right here is so unique and so vital to be had. But we've, um, you know, uh, an outgrowth of our Sunday camp sessions is a, a Facebook group that started independent of us called uh, Crip Camp 2020. And there are people there that are finding community. People are connecting throughout the world, sending photographs, introducing themselves, talking about their issues. And you know that, that kind of bringing together of people, which was what we heard so early on, is happening virtually if it's not happening today you know, in the, in the physical world. I am. Um, I totally agree with Jim. And I just wanted to also say that I think um, one of our other goals was to, uh, with the film, was to lift up the civil rights history of the disability community, which has been so overlooked and not taught and not known, and to really like um, try to try to lift it up on on a big enough platform that you know, Americans would own it as something they were proud of and also learn from it because the particular way in which the ADA came to be and 504 came to be is so extraordinary. And it is a really um, powerful example of, of uh, cross movement organizing. Um, so, you know, we have really seen that that has started to be true. People have started to demand that it be taught. There's a discussion later today, I think, um, at Duke University of history teachers, you know, discussing how, how to teach the film and all of that. But I think one of the things that's been the most um, gratifying for me in this particular moment that we're in is to see, see people who are out on the front lines of the Black Lives Matter protests today sort of um, calling up some of the examples like, you know, the Black Panthers bringing food or, you know, people saying like, if you don't believe this can happen and this can actually change laws, watch Crip Camp, you know, it, it can be done and that kind of, so for, to, to kind of connect that history that's so important and has been so overlooked to exactly what's going on today and that people are doing that themselves is, is really gratifying. Um, and, and Andrea and Storm, for you, what have, been some of the successes that you've been like, yes, this is, like, I'm really gratified to know that this campaign has made a difference in this particular way. I mean, I could speak to all of the big lofty things, you know, that um, have, have happened, the amazing partnerships, the corporate partnerships, like the fellowship program with Adobe and all of that. And, and they're amazing. We have an, a really, Cool educational curriculum um, that's coming out. We've got, you know, Nicole mentioned the ER fund and the fellowship and, and all of those things. But I had a moment yesterday um, with a young person that made me go, if it was worth, like, out of all of it, this made it worth it. I was um, talking to a young person who uh, lives in in Texas, who is um, working on um, some voting rights stuff for disabled people, and she's the only one, uh, the first of, of this kind um, of position, and it's a paid position. 
And um, she clearly watches on Sundays and um, a friend of mine introduced us. And just seeing her awe at, um, you know, the power of Crip Camp, but the opportunity, I mean, it was, we're talking and, and I felt like a celebrity and that's not how, and it, it had nothing to do with me. It was just because she, we are so not used to seeing people like us um, take up space and actually, um, you know, the change that is happening, the conversations that are happening. Um, and I was just like, wow, it was all worth it because she, at, you know, 22, 23 years old, um, my goodness, the, the things that she's going to do and people like, you know, because of these communities and these conversations that we're having, I mean, we're, we're excited to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the ADA next month. Um, but I was just thinking, oh my gosh, what are the, what is it 60 years going to look like because of people like her leading um, the movement? And so to me, those are the conversations and those are the things that mean, um, that mean the most. So that's my biggest success. Yeah, and Susie in the chat said that youth leadership is key for this moment and for the disability revolution. Uh, Storm, what's been gratifying for you? Uh, what, what gains, what progress have you seen coming out of the campaign? Actually, to actually see, you know, like Andrea mentioned, the, you know, the 8,000 registered, to see the program launching, and then more to be part of this as an advisory fellowship, and then bring a friend of mine who's deaf herself, and Black woman who's deaf, and to get her in, and she accepted as an advisory. So we really are just personally just really ready to roll up our sleeves and get out there Black, Brown, the IPOC, bring the program in, maybe not often, you know, they're not used to, I love what Andrea say, you know, they, we look the same. Oh, okay. But not often that happens, but you know, it gets close enough and you get the access from us. Wow. You know, so I know that that program really has, hasn't started yet, but I'm already proud to actually see it happening and very soon and aligned with the celebration of ADA and aligned with the celebration of you know, the film and Crip Camp. So really just the top of what current's going on today, Black Lives Matter. So it's beacon of hope, beacon of power, be an example for what we can do. You know, I don't, it, I just can't really, it can't really measure that, you know, how I feel and what we feel collectively. It's just, it's huge, it's huge. You really are raising, just scratching the surface to see, you know, that we are here. We're here. Natalie, if I can, I want to clarify um, the program that, that Storm is talking about is this partnership that we um, have developed with Adobe. It's a fellowship program. And so um, there will be uh, 10 to 12 disabled um, folks, and um, majority um, Black Indigenous people of color who are emerging um, in the creative spaces. And so we have six amazing advisors who will support um, these 12 emerging leaders in, in, and really already leaders, I don't even love that word, but um, to create capstone projects. And so we have, you know, folks like Storm in advertising, we have um, Alice Wong, who, you know, is, is a pillar in our community, um, runs the Disability Visibility Project. We have graphic designers, we have Alice Shepard, who is a dancer, we have just signed on Jillian Mercado, who is a model, we have kind of the whole gamut of, of disabled creatives that are going to um, be supporting this, again, this, this generation of leaders moving forward. So we're really excited about this program. Wow, so much to lift up. And of course, the time is flying by. So we've got to get in some uh, audience questions, um, as many as we can before we have to sign out. But um, let me see. I see Sylvia asks, how do you measure and monitor the effect of the impact campaign? Which is a great question. Um, Andrea, I'll give that to you or Storm, either one of you. Jim, were you going to say something? I saw you on. 
Oh, okay. So, yeah, like, um, how do we measure the impact? It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a great question. Um, I think ultimately, you know, we might, we'll have numbers, we're monitoring just our engagement um, each Sunday. We're um, looking at, you know, how much funding we're raising. And, and yet, for me, sustainability is the biggest measurement um, as well. So that's why we've been so strategic about creating partnerships that will live on past whatever the, the, the formal campaign um, funding looks like. So, you know, it is our hope and we've expressed the desire that this fellowship program is not a one year thing, that it's a continual, you know, process, this partnership development with color of change that will lead to more. Um, and we have a lot of conversations like that. And, and so coming from a nonprofit background, always think, you know, they always ask you on the grant application, okay, what happens after this funding? What are you, you know, going to do? And so sustainability, I think, is going to be the real key, um, the measurement of, uh, so I'm, it, and for me, it's quality over quantity. It just so happens that we have 8,000 people registered, but uh, we would have done it just the same if there were 50. Gotcha. Storm, did you want to add to that? No, Andrea said it beautifully. Jim or Nicole, did you want to speak to um, measuring and monitoring the, um, the effect of the impact campaign? I mean, I agree with Andrea at, about both things, sustainability and, and quality. Um, I think often we get too fixated on, you know, numbers of clicks and numbers of people engaged, et cetera, you know. Um, and I think that, uh, again, like one of the things that's been really impressive for me to watch is the way in which um, Andrea and uh, when Stacy was here, Stacy too, have been so um, clear with the partners that they're engaging with about those goals being um, really wanting to make systemic change. It's like if people come and say, well, we want to do, like a company might come and say, we want to do a screening for all of our employees. And, uh, and talk about the, the movie and the, the, the careful thinking about who's gonna be on the panel and what is that gonna mean and, and, and making sure that it's not just, you know, um, me and Jim and Judy talking about the film but making sure that it's an opportunity to lift up other voices and other stories and making sure that um, almost like uh, saying like, we can do this, but we wanna know what are you committed to as a company in terms of you know, disability and access going forward and, um, and, and really being strategic in that way. And so I feel like it's almost that, like we, we could look back at the, um, at the NGOs and companies and various people that we've been engaging with um, throughout the campaign and, and look at like what kind of uh, long-term or systemic change uh, may have resulted, you know, in part from this engagement. I, mean, I think a part of the, ongoing work of the film and the campaign is to really <laughs> let people know we're here. And that, um, you know, it, it, it used to be a lot worse than it is today, but when there were um, diversity or inclusion efforts going on, disability was not on anybody's radar. And, and but people with disabilities really cut across every strata of society and and you know what i've seen in my life is that it's getting better that you don't have to kind of shout say hey what about uh folks but i i do believe there's still i think there's always going to be a certain amount of push that we need to do well someone in the audience asked uh, uh her name is natasha Ophelia, I think I'm saying that correctly. And she asked, which relates to what you just said, Jim, what does it take to get more people with disabilities in higher positions that have nothing to do with their disabilities or being in a disability department? Can I start that one off? Absolutely. Uh, it, Absolutely. It, it touches upon something that Storm was talking about, which is that when we have the opportunity to uh, get through that door that we do what we can to bring others with us. And that, 
You know, uh, there was a part in the movie that never made it into the film, uh, which was a, a meeting I had with Judy. Um, and I talked to her about my having kind of left the community activism because I was so busy with my job at the Berkeley Rep and then getting my career in film. And I felt bad about that. And she said, Jimmy, she always calls me Jimmy. She said, you know, we had our eyes on you the whole time. You were doing what the movement was all about. Because you were a person with a disability, not working in the disability world, but in the quote unquote real world. And, and so it, it takes for, it really takes for us to advocate for others, to take those opportunities while you're getting a cup of coffee at work, kind of talking about, you know, the issues involving unemployment or who's not, and, and who's not in the room. And this goes beyond just disability. I mean, you have to look at who, you know, what is the makeup of our society and who's not working at this company or who doesn't have a position of authority. And that goes well beyond disability. It goes beyond, you know, it, it goes to the color of your skin or your sexual preference. Storm, did you want to add to that? Yes. Uh, two things that I was thinking of. Um, one, right now, you know, I'm, it's ongoing work, but recently, yesterday, at BBDO LA, um, I participated in a group, in, in two groups that are really pushing to the next level of diversity, equity, and inclusion at BBDO LA and New York. So, on, I'm on the at t account in LA, and we're really pushing for more opportunities to invite and literally hire more people and get involved and work in advertising for those who, you know, just are good, but emphasize in the meeting that we are president of BBDO worldwide and the CEO is, we have to include disability. We must. So they're really getting it and hearing. And I always emphasize that because, you know, if you're talking and saying you're inclusive, but you're not hiring, then obviously the untapped margin, you can't say you're inclusive. Diversity inclusive? No. So, so when we are in that, you know, in those groups, so any type of industry, you know, we have a responsibility to take advantage of, like Jim said, everyone on the panel said, we need to elevate each other up and try to use our power the best way we can to continue, hey, and bring in, one becomes two, and then later it becomes five, and then, then it becomes 10. It becomes an, a standard of organization. Uh, also, I'm big on story and visual telling. And on the screen. So we need to really provide more people with disability at the screen. It doesn't matter wherever, because statistics are already, the research is already saying 55% that people who see, people who see um, people with disability on TV, they feel uncomfortable because they're not exposed to that. They're, they're not exposed to the idea of people with disability doing whatever normal things. They're like, no, we need to change that number and be inclusive and change the number of in the workforce. So that's why we're here. You know, that's one of the many ways to elevate in the industry without having to work disability related department unit. But, you know, we could do so much more. We can contribute for the greater change. Absolutely. And another question, and this is gonna have to be the last question, uh, that we take, but another question is, um, is a collective approach possible? Uh, the the, the um, audience member is talking about how each disability has its own agenda and goals, but is a collective approach possible? And what's the action steps towards that? I'm going to do a lightning round. I'm going to start with Andrea and everyone will have a chance to speak to that question. Yes, I hope so. And that's our goal. And we, um, it's by listening to each other. Um, because I know for the campaign specifically, we've learned a lot because we only come with our own lived experiences. So it's listening to each other and coming together um, cross, move, cross disability. Jim? 
Well, I, I, actually, the history of uh, the 504 was really that these groups came together. There used to be just like the blind really looking out for the blind. And, and, and these different groups came together under one umbrella to really force this change for the first time. So I, I'm, you know, although we may have different goals, it really is that are particular to our disabilities. It's the same goal. It's the same goal of, of um, providing, um, creating a world in which we can participate in society however we want to. Nicole? Sorry, you see that in the scene uh, that we call message to parents in Crip Camp where kids are sitting around the table at camp and, and listening to each other and, um, and taking, giving people the time they need to speak and translating for each other if necessary about really making sure that everybody gets heard. And I've seen that modeled in such a beautiful way in the virtual Crip Camp by Andrea who is um, moderating and uh, different access needs are coming in, you know, and there's thousands of people on, on these calls and um, and having somebody specifically dedicated to taking those and um, and and I, I don't know if you invented it, Andrea, but Andrea will just say like, we're going to take an access break and we're going to change this or we're going to do that, you know, and, and I've thought many times how beautiful that is and how similar it is to the spirit of what of what you see in the film and how, uh, what a powerful lesson that is about, um, about movement building in general and how, how, how we can really make change. Absolutely. Storm, I'm gonna give you the last word. I would say it's possible, depending on, on what pace, you know, because like we have an umbrella of disability. There's so many sub disability communities within the cultures. Like for me, part of deaf and hard of hearing community, you know, that we share that sign language and require accommodation for interpreters. We also have deaf and hard of hearing plus blind, plus, plus, plus. So at the same time, we have to, part of the disabilities to certain things that Maybe we can't, you know, you, you don't understand or we can't understand. So we have to start with ourselves. And at the same time, what's the goal and have a conversation and what activities we can, you know, support and advocate for each other. And then we can come together and become one collective goal. So it's definitely possible because Crip Camp has a group, young group. And then when they went out into the world, it just, it changed. Everything changed. So where the where it leads that we can have the right to be protected by the legislat legislation, the 503 and the 504 and, and the ADA. So there's there's more to be done. So I would like to say it's possible to have a collective goal and a collective movement and a collective change.